From Isolation Studios, it's Richard Krauss. Welcome everybody to In Isolation With, the talk show where we make a connection without actually making contact. I'm Richard Krauss. I hope you're staying healthy, I hope you're staying happy, and I hope that you're staying safe. My guest today joins me on Zoom from his home in Dublin. Mike Scott is the founding member, lead singer, guitarist, and songwriter of The Water Boys. He is a restless, creative spirit known for radical changes in musical style throughout what he refers to as his, quote, allegedly unorthodox, end quote, career. The music on his solo albums and with The Water Boys explores a number of different styles, including folk, Celtic, and rock and roll, fusing them all together to create a sound that is not only really catchy, but utterly unique. The press release for his newest record, Good Luck Seeker, says the songs are populated by unrepentant freaks, soul legends, outlaw film stars, and 20th century mystics, drawing inspiration from The Stones, Kate Bush, Sly and Kendrick, as well as Mike Scott's very own musical past. It's a genre-busting effort with epic songs like the dramatic spoken word tune My Wanderings in the Weary Land to the earworm of the extremely catchy single The Soul Singer. In this interview, we talk about lots of stuff. We talk about the construct of time, the power of the clash, and why he liked a record by Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick, and Tish, enough to spend eight and sixpence, or about 50 cents on it. I began the interview by asking Mike Scott why he's never made the same record twice. Here's what he had to say. I, I like to keep changing, mm. Richard. And I, I grew up listening to artists like Dylan and the Beatles and Neil Young. And, you know, I'm a child of the 60s when music changed vastly over a period of five or six years. So to me, it's normal that music should keep changing. And I, it, it, I feel if there isn't some progression going on in Waterboy's music, there's something wrong. And, and I think I've had a few periods when there wasn't enough progression, but now isn't one of those. Do you think that it's something that you, you have to push for, or is, is it just a wandering creative spirit? Does it just happen organically? And it just happens, but I have yeah. to maintain a sense of exploration and experiment. I've got to keep pushing my own boundaries. Mm -hmm. During the pandemic, have, have you found that music and or writing music has been some sort of solace for you or, or helped maybe work through any anxiety you might have been feeling? No, I haven't been. Well, I, I, anxiety. I don't really have a lot of personal anxiety around the pandemic. I'm more concerned about whether the, the center will hold, as WB Yeats might have said. Mm -hmm. So far it is holding, but I think only just yeah. Uh, for me, my experience has been 50% of the time parenting with my seven-year-old daughter and the rest of the time working on music. And after I finished Good Luck Seeker, uh, I made the next Waterboys album, which was made in January, February, March. It's finished and it'll have to wait now for a year before we can release it. And I've also remixed and remastered our appointment with Mr. Yates' album from 2011. So that will be reissued in the autumn. I didn't realize that you had these records stacked up so far in advance. By the time something like this comes out, because I think the release date for Good Luck Seeker is August 21st. Uh, right. You made it months before. Is it old news to you by then? Have you already moved on and you've written a new batch of songs and, and it, it, it feels like it's not the next thing, so it's not the most interesting thing to you? Well, fortunately, somewhere along the way, I discovered that time is an illusion. I, I can think myself back into whatever record I want or whatever stage of my own life I need to. Uh, and, and honestly, Good Luck Seeker, it might have been finished six months ago, but it's not really old to me. I've had some records where, where the tracks were seven or eight years old before they came out. So this is a luxury. It doesn't feel ever to you like you have a catalog of your life. When you hear a record from 15 years ago, from beyond that, that you can be transported back to a time and a place? Well, of course they do. But it's not such an unusual experience because everybody has that experience with other people's songs. Mm. You know, and I hear 
records from the, the 60s or 70s or 80s that take me back to whatever I was doing then, whether they're my records or not. Now that there is no live music for us to go out and yeah. see, uh, yeah. can you think back to a particularly memorable live concert, whether it was one of yours that you were performing or yeah. a show that changed your life in some way? I think seeing The Clash in 1977. Yeah. Well, it might I, be the first punk rock concert I went to. And, and I, actually, the draw for me was the support act, which was Richard Hell and the Voidoids. Yeah, yeah. Because I loved New York punk, and I was a huge Patti Smith fan and so on. And, and Richard was good, but then The Clash came out, and it was like an army, four, a four-man army. I'd never seen energy like it on stage. You know, I'd seen The Who and The Stones, Pink Floyd, I'd seen lots of great bands, but The Clash just knocked them, knocked them into next week. I only saw The Clash much later in mm. their career when they were playing much larger venues and, and things. And the show was good. The show was good, but I had read about this, this, this tidal wave of feeling that would come over you while you saw it. And that was not my experience with it, but I saw them at, I think, the wrong stage uh, in their career. Yeah, I saw them at all times, right yeah. through till shortly before they split, and they were never as good as 1977. Yeah. Still pretty good in 78. So uh, we're talking, it's nine o'clock at night, your time. You say you're splitting your time 50-50 between music and, and parenting. Uh, what is your songwriting process? Do you, is, is it like a job that you would sit down and, and write a song? Or is it something you might not write a song for weeks on end? Or how does it work for you? I might not write a song for weeks or months. Mm. And, and the older I get, the more I, I find I write when I need to write. You know, you, you asked me a, a few minutes ago about the new record, Was it is it old to me? Mm -hmm. uh, and I find if I don't need to make a record, I just put the writing on pause in the back of my mind. Right. And then when I need it, it comes. It's a weird thing. For me, the idea of writing a song is uh, a mystery. It's something mystical that happens. And uh, for you, when you started writing songs, do you recall the first songs that you wrote? And do you recall uh, what they were about and, and why, I guess, why you wrote them? Well, my first songs were sort of thinly disguised copies of songs that other people had already written. <laughs> like Bob Dylan or Mark Bowen. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I, I'm glad to say I quickly grew out of that. And, and songs for me, oh, before I ever wrote a song, I wanted to live in music. Mm. I wanted to be inside music, and I wanted to know. The the big thrill for me wasn't wasn't oh my goodness, will we meet groupies after the concert? I was never thinking about stuff like that. I was thinking, what did John Lennon feel like when when he he when he first imagined the second verse of A Day in the Life. Yeah. I wanted to know what was it like being in that song? What did Paul feel when he was writing down the Rigby? That's what I wanted. I wanted that experience. And, and it's become my life, mm -hmm. being in songs. And when I'm writing a song, I might be inside it for weeks, just singing it over and over and over. And whatever else I'm doing, the song's going on in my mind. Um, Soul Singer uh, is so catchy. And it's just such a, 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 a great um, soul swing song. I, 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 it, it, I can hear it in my head right now uh, as we speak. Um, when you write a song like that, and I'm not looking for, for names, but is that completely out of your imagination or is it based on experience or, or how does that work? It's a way with being rude. Cause everyone's scared of his quicksilver moods, the soul singer. He's been around for 50 years, every crease of his face is a souvenir, the soul singer. He's seen it all, made every move, dude's got next to nothing left to prove. Climb to the top. Been through the ringer, ladies and gentlemen, the soul singer. Experience and observation of many different people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And That's it's a time. 
you know, it's a type. And, and there are even a few lines that, that I've lived myself. In terms of, of songwriting, how much of yourself do you feel uh, obliged to expose or how much of yourself do you say, okay, this is my life with my family. I don't write about that. Or do you have anything that's off topic? I never think about it, Richard. Mm. I, I just write the songs and maybe, maybe there's some subconscious barrier there that I, I won't go beyond, but I, but I haven't thought about it. Mm -hmm. I think often it's, it's in, and again, in, in situations like this where you have someone asking your questions where you create a process, it, it becomes kind of an odd thing because I often think it's best not to overthink these mm. things and, and just allow the inspiration to hit when it does and, and, and the work will be what it's going to be based on, on your frame of mind at the moment. It's, I go through phases. Sometimes I write very autobiographically. Mm. Two albums ago, uh, we did a double album called Out of All This Blue. That's much more autobiographical. Lots of my uh, romantic relationships are in that album. And the, the last, the side four of the double album vinyl version is all about meeting and courting my wife. So and very how, autobiographical at that time. How did she feel about uh, having bits of your life together chronicled in, in song? She was okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Let's talk then about some of the cover versions of the songs that you have written because people like Prince and Rod Stewart and Tom Jones and Steve Earle have recorded your songs. Uh, again, is that uh, something that you, uh, that you encourage? Is that something that you love when it happens? Or is it something that is just a byproduct of, of your business? I love it. Absolutely love it, Richard, especially when they make it their own. Yeah. Sometimes I'll hear a cover version where, where I think, oh, oh, he's trying to sound like me. <laughs> and I don't like that so much. I right. like when people put their own stamp on it. Like Fiona Apple's Hole of the Moon makes it completely okay. her own. The first concert that you ever went to was an Emerson, Lake and Palmer concert. But you said the first, the first great concert that you went to was Paul McCartney and Wings. Uh, yeah. what, what was the difference between the two? I think I, can, I, think I know, but tell me the, the difference. Well, I was a much bigger fan of Paul than I was of Emerson, Lake and Palmer. It was an older pal uh, called Frank Myrtle. And he'd been to lots of concerts. He was about three years older than me. And he thought, oh, Mike's ready to go to a concert. So he took me to see Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And I only knew one of their songs, which was called Knife Edge, because it had been on one of those sampler compilation albums that the labels right. used to do in those days. Uh, and, and I don't think they even played Knife Edge. So it was a lot of stuff I didn't know. And it, some parts were impressive. I still remember Keith Emerson riding his organ like a bucking bronco and throwing knives at it and all that. I, I can still remember that, but it didn't, it didn't move me so much. Yeah. It was more just a thrilling experience to be at a concert. And it was at a famous venue called uh, Green's Playhouse in Glasgow, which later was called the Apollo. It was kind of like our, um, our Fillmore East. Right, right. And this is, it was the same place where I saw Paul McCartney and Wings six months later. But of course, I loved Paul and knew him so well and I knew lots of the songs and, and, and he's a great showman. It was a fantastic gig. Last Night in Soho, Davy D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick and Tish was your first record that you ever bought. It was indeed. And, and what was it about that record? I was nine years old, Richard, and <laughs> the, the record begins with a, 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 a drum, Spanish acoustic guitar, which I now know that they ripped off Jumping Jack Flash, which had been a hit a few months earlier. And then there's a sort of backwards or phasey guitar. And I think I fell in love with that guitar sound. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it cost me, in, in, in British money, it cost me eight and sixpence halfpenny, which is probably about 50 cents. Well, 50 cents well spent, if you loved yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations on Good Luck Seeker. Uh, now I can't wait to hear the next one. <laughs> now that you've got, I know that there's more Waterboys music uh, tucked away waiting to be released next year. I'm excited about that as well. But in the meantime, Good Luck Seeker will spend a lot of time uh, being played around the house here. It's, uh, it's really great. 
Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. He's done crazy. He's suffered loss for the life that he lives. He's paid the cost, the soul singer. They call him curmudgeon, say he's a churl. Stories follow him round the world. Hear this one, man, a home dinger. Ladies and gentlemen, the soul singer. That was my interview with Mike Scott of The Water Boys. You can find his new album, Good Luck Seeker, wherever you legally download and buy music. Well, that's it for today. My thanks to Mike Scott for his time. But most of all, as always, my biggest thanks goes to you for watching. I'm Richard Krause. Stay healthy, happy, and safe. And we'll talk again soon.